Cool. Also, uh, thanks to Shweta for that talk. I'm in the process of figuring out uh, a path to get there. So that was very useful for me. Um, okay. Uh, so for this one, we'll be going through a bit of a technical discussion. Um, and today I'll be talking about uh, the fundamental architecture of server-driven UIs specifically with an eye towards mobile development. Um, it's uh, just something I've worked on with my team recently. And so I've been reading about this and working on it. So it's it seemed like a good topic. Um, all right, a uh, little bit about me. So as Angie mentioned, I'm currently a senior software engineer. I've been working broadly within the maps org at Google. But I've worked on many different things uh, at the crossover of search and maps. Um, and I uh, like to do many things in my free time, biking, running, board games, cooking. I love going on long walks in the city when it's summer. I don't like winter. Um, and yeah, you can reach me if you want to chat more after. Uh, OK, so. Briefly, in today's talk, we're going to go over what server-driven UI is, and then just a very simplified architecture overview uh, with some of the main components uh, that we use in this type of architecture. And then we'll see some examples in the real world. And then we'll conclude with how you can make the trade-off between server-driven UIs and uh, just rendering uh, on clients. If you are building an app or if you want to think about uh, app development in general. Um, cool. So um, server-driven UI has actually existed for a long time, like even before uh, mobiles were a thing just in for websites. The very initial days of websites was just you throw some static HTML on the page, and that's kind of it. Um, and then we started to get a little bit more interactivity by hooking them up to servers. And PHP used to be, it still is used, but it used to be a more popular like scripting language that you could use to kind of send more interaction data to your client. But this was very much client-side rendering. So your web browser gets all the information. And then it decides how to lay out the page combining these things. Um, and then we got powerful desktop PCs. So with that, uh, there was a need for more complicated interactive websites. Um, and then JavaScript came along. So that solved so a lot of the, like, make fancy animations on website needs. Uh, but the key is it really did need like powerful PCs to get that right and performant. Because what happened with JavaScript based client side rendering was when you came around to the um, like everybody has cell phones age. Um, it was it was hard to deal with the different network bandwidths and poor connections and all of these things when you were when you're not just sitting on like a desktop connected to the internet. So um, you just get a blank page if you had poor connection and the browser was waiting for JavaScript to load. So that brought us back to uh, server side rendering. Um, and it kind of helps us deal with this complicated matrix of needs from like different device types and browsers and internet bandwidths and connection issues. Um, so it is for uh, mobile development, it is ex essentially an extension out of web server side rendering. Um, architecturally, it's very similar uh, and the differences more come down to implementation details. So it's kind of like a cyclical origin story in that sense. Um, so uh, here is a very simplified overview of how server-driven UIs work. So you have your traditional client-server model where you send a request to render some screen or a page, and then eventually you get back a response. 
In the server-driven UI world, the response from the server includes both rendering templates and the actual data. So the client isn't making decisions on what goes where on the page. It just gets the page and throws it up. Um, so it's like a thin client paradigm. And then the server is doing like pretty much all of the work. Uh, and you have a lot of components going on here. So the server has to deal with uh, building a data model by calling to other backends, getting whatever data you need. And then it also deals with putting together the UI templates. So all of your components for the UI for example, buttons and cards and image carousels, et cetera, would be built on the server. Um, and so obviously your design system for like fonts and colors and things like that is also on the server because that's where the UI is. So this is just a very basic uh, overview. Um, and the next thing we're gonna talk about is some of the main components that uh, end up in the server for this type of architecture paradigm. So the first thing we see is standardized data models. So this is if you're designing a server-driven UI architecture, this is probably the most important design decision that you have to make. So spend uh, enough time on this. What you're trying to do is design a data layer very carefully so that you can compose pages and screens out of it in a scalable way. Uh, what that means is drawing some generalizations from your app's UI features. So here's an example uh, on the left, or the, the, the red text um, is an example of a data schema that's very, very uh, dependent on the specifics of the UI. So maybe you have a card with an image and a button, and you just decide to represent those as your data. Um, but a more composable schema, you might want to design it as like a card is just a generic box of stuff. And then you can have a list of things in the card. And the list of things is also an abstraction that could be some text or an image or a button or any sort of uh, smaller UI component. So in that way, you can compose a card from a list of card elements, and then you can compose a page from cards, et cetera. So th think in terms of interfaces um, and abstractions instead of like, here's three buttons and an image. So it's just gonna be an image and a button data model. Um, so yeah, th just, it's a fine balance of drawing enough abstractions, um, but not just ending up with a page data model. So this is something that's worth putting some thought into. Um, and the next thing is the request and response API. Um, this, I guess, is a fundamental part, not just for server-driven UIs, but also just any sort of app development. Um, so you can think about breaking this down for the specific architecture, breaking this down into uh, your main components. And uh, you can take inspiration from your data model design for this, um, primarily for the response. Um, you can kind of look at your page and analyze what it contains. And then you can like label some UI chunks in there. So this is a very abstract page. You might have a header, you might have some images, some other text details, a footer maybe. So you, you have a bunch of UI elements on the page. Uh, what they contain in particular is not that important. It's just data that's going to be filled in. Um, so the response API, you just kind of have to describe the layout of the page any response level metadata, or maybe you're tracking user clicks and so on, uh, you can add those things to the various blocks on the page. So it really just boils down to a page or a screen composed of several blocks or sections. Um, so, uh, 
I don't know if the raised hand is a question. Is it okay if I wait until the end for questions? Okay, yeah, um, cool. Um, and the next thing is uh, standardizing your design system. So obviously this is an important part of designing a website or an app. Uh, like coming up with a design language that fits uh, your needs. Um, but for server-driven UIs, you have to make sure you maintain consistency cross-platform because you can use the server to send. Uh, you have one code base for rendering, and it goes to, let's say, Android and iOS, and maybe also web. Um, so come up with a standardized uh, system to make these decisions, um, like you know fonts and background colors and things like that. And it all gets centralized on the server, which is really nice. So that allows for quick updates instead of you going to the your Android app code and updating the button to be a different color, and then also having to do the same thing on iOS. You just update it on the back end and it gets pushed out to both. So that's helpful. Um, and then uh, another important thing is versioning capabilities. So you have to make sure when you add new capabilities for rendering on the server that it doesn't break old client runtimes because they don't support whatever you just added. Um, so Basically, you have to use some kind of versioning system that can indicate uh, that that the clients can use to indicate whether or not they support a certain capability. So this contrived example uh, just says, if hey, if this client supports rendering background gradients on a card, then do that. Otherwise, specify some kind of fallback that still looks fine. Um, if you ignore versioning, lots of things can happen that are all bad. You can have unpredictable behavior, things can look weird without uh, suitable fallbacks. And if any, if you add user action hooks, like uh, functionality for what happens when a certain button is clicked, it might just not work or crash. So yeah, versioning, very important. Um, so here are, uh, just some examples of some popular applications in the wild that use a server-driven paradigm. Um, so Airbnb is one, and they kind of uh, use it for some screens in their app, not all. So one of them is this like check availability page. So they break it down into all of these sections, like the header, footer, and details, etc. And it's all... Uh, you know, in this data model, and then the server fetches the data, styles the page, and sends it on. So very similar with Duolingo. They have all of these things rendered on the serving end. Uh, like, it's a carousel of buttons where the buttons indicate different things uh, that the user sees. And then Reddit is another one. So. If you look at their old response, it's very customized and it lists specifics about the UI. But then if you look at the new response, it's more composable and more generic. And it's just, here's a bunch of cells and here's stuff that's in those cells. And the stuff could be text or links or whatever. Um, so much easier to update and change as well. Um, Yelp is another one. Similar components, actions, cards. Um, so if you are choosing uh, which to use, if you're developing an app or a website and you want it to be on various client platforms, um, you can you you can you just have to consider trade-offs like with every other architectural decision. So some of the upsides of server server driven UI is updates and bug fixes are much faster um, because you don't need to wait for a new client binary on the App Store or Play Store. 
you can just fix things on the server side and it can even get pushed out to old clients. So it's that's a huge upside. Um, and then on good networks, server-driven UI tends to load faster and just because it sends a fully formed UI. Um, and then, uh, of course, another benefit is because you've moved all of this layouting logic to the server, the binary size is actually pretty small for an Android or iOS or other OS binary so, because there's the client just doesn't have any logic. Um, on the other hand, obviously, offline support uh, is not a thing with server-driven UI, so you'd have to kind of build that on the client if needed. Um, and then there is performance overhead because more things are coming back uh, in a server response. And then as we talked about briefly with the data model designs, uh, it can be more architecturally complex to design upfront. So there is an increased upfront cost, which pays off if you design carefully and put some more time into the, that process. So it's just something to consider. Um, and then uh, you should still go with more traditional, like render individually on each client kind of approaches if offline support is really important to you. Um, or if you have really complicated animations that really require native functionality, those screens are good for client rendering still. Um, and it's easier to start with that kind of approach for really basic pages and apps, um, just because you don't have to make any uh, major design decisions that can't be changed later. So it's just uh, all of these are trade-offs you'd consider anyway if you're designing an app that has to be deployed to different platforms. So these are just some considerations. Um, uh, so which one you choose, it depends. Uh, and you can, ideally you can use both approaches in one app. Um, Server-driven UI is great, but it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it doesn't work for everything, but it's pretty good for a lot of uh, kind of main screens and your apps, main use cases. For example, in the Airbnb example, we saw the check availability page. So if you design it carefully, it's great for all of those use cases. Um, but still, client-driven UIs can be used for really basic UIs that would have rare updates or complicated native performant animations. So yeah, just all of these things to consider. Um, yeah, and... I think that was it. It's just a very brief overview into two different rendering paradigms focusing on server-driven UI. So hopefully you can make more informed choices if you have to make these decisions. Thanks. Um, thank you for that.